Hi, this is uh, E. David Crawford from the University of Colorado. Joining me in Grand Rounds in Neurology today is one of the world authorities in prostate cancer, Dr. Jock Schalken from Nijmegen in the Netherlands. Jock uh, has made some major contributions uh, to our diagnostic armamentarium in prostate cancer and treatment over the years. Um, he is well known for his work in developing the urinary marker PCA3, which has turned out to be an excellent marker uh, for prostate cancer. Uh, but he sort of fine tuned this with a new marker called Select MDX, which is a marker that focuses on what we need to find prostate cancers that are aggressive. And this falls all under the umbrella of liquid biopsies. And so I'm very excited that Jock is joining us uh, today. And I'll turn it over to you for your presentation, Jock. Thanks. Well, thank you, uh, David. It is my pleasure to present uh, an update on the urinary-based biomarkers for prostate cancer. But let me start off with a very brief introduction because it's almost 15 years ago that we provided evidence for the proof of concept that prostate cancer cells do shed into the urine, presumably via invasion into the secretory SNI of the prostate. And that in turn uh, led to what we now call the first in-class urine test for prostate cancer uh, called Progenza PCA3. The old name was DD3. And that came on the market roughly 10 years ago through Hologic GenPro. Apart from the strengths of the urine test, there was some uh, limitation as well. What you see in this cartoon is the tissue level of expression of PCA3 in non-malignant tissues and in cancers. And from left to right, you go from low grade, high grade to CRPC to metastases. And you see that even though PCA3 was unique, there was an odd characteristics in that some of the high-grade cancers were missed by the test. I should stress here that PCA3 was never identified as a progression marker. And just last year, we summarized that with roughly 12,000 cases where you can again see that PCA3 is very high in low-grade cancers, but you are starting to miss some of the high-grade cancers. So with that progressive insight, uh, we moved on uh, to a new discovery effort where we pretty much now again use well-characterized, high-quality uh, tissue, and we sought to identify true progression markers. Because as you said in the introduction, we want to identify patients with clinically significant cancers rather than the ones with indolent cancer. So through this cascade of finding biomarkers, selecting them on, based on their progression characteristics, doing a first study on urine, because again, we wanted to look at urine, of course, because it's non-invasive substrate. And through two independent clinical studies, we developed the new biomarker panel. We published that in 2015 in cancer research. And what you see is that in all the studies, of course, we included PCA3 as a comparator in its ability to identify the clinically significant cancers was a big step forward on the new biomarker panel. That pretty much is based on the fact that some of the markers here are really finding high-grade cancers. So this is purely the urine test. So urine after DRE, and the end point of the study is clinically significant cancer. The nice thing that you see is that if you look at the various PSA categories, is that even at low PSA, the ability of the urine test to identify the men with high-grade cancer remains the same. So pretty much the urine test is able to identify with high accuracy men with high-grade cancer also in the low serum PSA range. The next step was clearly to take advantage not only of the urine test, but also to include clinical parameters such as a history of prostate cancer, PSA, prostate volume, and so on. And that is in fact what then was uh, select MDX. It's a risk classifier that combines clinical parameters that you have available with the urine test. 
And in that paper in 2016, we showed that when we did this, and the model two that you see in this cartoon and in this graph is in fact the select MDX algorithm. Uh, in the dotted blue line, you see the primary cohort, and this is the validation cohort. With an AUC of 0.9, we can predict high grade uh, cancers. And therefore, it is a very simple procedure now. The evidence that we have so far is for, for patients with a PSA between 3 and 10 or 15. We don't have too much data for the lower PSAs yet. It's a non invasive test, it can be done part of the routine examination, and it will give you an indication whether or not that patient needs a biopsy. If you look at the clinical impact, the AUC for PCA3 was 0.68, and for the new urine test combined with clinical risk parameters, it's 0.9. The negative predictive value for high-grade cancer is 98%, and the sensitivity for the high-grade cancers is 92%. And that would result if you would take a specific threshold in the reduction of biopsies by 53%. So working on this concept of being able to predict biopsy outcome by a urine test you see that we made a significant progress from PCA3 to select MDX. We think the routine is going to be rather simple. An elevated DSA, PSA will lead you to the urine test. The lower risk will bring you back to the standard of care with just follow up by PSA. And we do have initial data that I've not included in this presentation that then multiparametric MRI would really be the tool of choice to select the man or to die or to biopsy the man. So again, summarizing the strength of the test, the very high NPV for the high grade cancers. And if I summarize everything in my conclusions, I think we now have a second in class urinary based risk calculator, select MDX. Uh, what we show in the same presentation in the model decision curve analysis that it will, can have a significant impact on clinical decision making. For the European situation, we have already shown that it is cost effective, so that because of the saving of the number of biopsies, it is cost effective to do the test. And we do have the initial data that this would be a great stratification tool for patients before they would go onto a MRI, multiparametric MRI guided or fusion biopsy. Well, that's more or less what I had to summarize, Dr. Crawford, and if there are any further discussion points, I'll be happy to address them. Jack, thanks for that very concise uh, presentation. Um, I think you, you're right on, right on it with, at least in the United States where we are with uh, the U.S. Services Preventive Task Force a few years ago, pointing out a, a lot of the drawbacks of prostate cancer early detection including finding insignificant cancers and, uh, and the side effects of biopsies. Uh, and this test, the way I use it, and I must say we've had experience now with almost 300 patients, is a test that focuses on finding high-grade cancers. Let me just ask you a couple of things, because this always comes up. Uh, um, what Tell us about DRE. Uh, you know, is this a massage, uh, an attentive DRE? Do you really have to do a DRE when you do this? And, and one of the reasons I ask about even doing DRE is a lot of family practice doctors are taught now not to do those. Well, well thank you for that bringing up that point, uh, David. Uh, so far, because we did not want to change too many parameters at the same time, we continued on with the normal procedure that we had for the initial tests, which is a standard uh, DRE. And it does make sense because it will push out content from the prostate to the prostatic uh, urethra. Uh, I think it's certainly advisable to see if we can uh, get rid of that uh, DRE. But what we have at the moment is the benchmark. We know that that's the maximum achievable diagnostic accuracy that we can reach. But I would certainly uh, applaud anyone who's going to, to try to do this also uh, without a DRE. So, Jack, um, the, uh, it, it's, it's, people think it's a massage. It's not a massage. It's just a, a 10 of DRE. You just sort of do a normal DRE, correct? Yeah, it's, it's norm, a, a normal uh, DRE. 
Okay, um, so it's not in, massage. In, in the big in the big cohort study in the Netherlands, uh, it it could we have modeled in the initial studies because we do think that prostate volume is an important parameter. Uh, a a three-tier assessment of prostate volume could also be done in that way. So normal, uh, slightly enlarged, or very much enlarged, and so that would the, bring in. The I mean, yeah, the other thing is, I you know, I think people say, well, is this going to detect transition zone cancers because you're not really massaging the transition zone? The data are early, but we tend to see so far that all cancers are pretty much being picked up. And we think that is because of the drainage system finally all goes to the prosthetic uh, urethra. And we have, I think, we, one or two papers where we did have the multi-parametric MRI and also the apical cancers are picked up quite nicely. So uh, uh, you're saying that uh, uh, that somebody has uh, somebody comes in, let's say the, the the big fishing net you throw out as the PSA, it's elevated, so you want to let the little fish out. So you do the select MDX test, it comes back positive, and then the next thing you do is a multi-parametric MRI. Um, or, you know, at, at least what we do are 12 core biopsies. So what are your thoughts about that? Um, the data on the multiparametric MRI are early. We just have a paper out a month ago or so where we clearly see that you can stratify the patients uh, for uh, a multiparametric MRI. If you have two tests, then I would always select the one with the highest NPV to go first. On the other hand, in certainly in our own uh, situation in Nijmegen, we have a lot of multi-parametric MRI. Uh, we do have a big cohort that we are going to present, hopefully at the EAU uh, this year, where we can exactly position, select uh, versus multi multi-parametric MRI. But certainly considering uh, the high NPV of select, I think it's, it really looks very solid to position that as a stratifying test before you go on to the multi-parametric MRI. But of course, that's all dependent on the availability of high quality MRI and multi-parametric MRI. Okay. Well, I, I've thrown a couple softballs at you. Let me throw a hardball. Um, there, are, there are other tests out there that um, are sort of in, the, in this bucket of competition, including PHI, PCA3, and poor K-score. So can you just briefly comment on where you think those fit in and the pros and cons and so forth? Uh, a good point. I, I, if, if you would, I would divide them in two subgroups. Uh, one of them would be purely calicrane based and one of them would be where there is a, a urine test involved. The head-to-head -head comparison that we have is of course PCA3 and SELECT. And I've shown you the data. There is no doubt that Select MDX outperforms uh, PCA3. There have been a couple of studies where you compare PCA3 and PHI, and you could kind of interpolate that, and then you would predict that Select also would outperform uh, PHI. Clearly, the head to head comparisons between PHI, OPCO 4K, the new PSA isoforms, I'm not sure whether that will be ever fully completed. But considering what we have presented and what others have shown, I would predict objectively that the combination of a urine test and the strength of calicreans, that that combination, which we pretty much have in select, has the highest uh, potential. But some of them will be very close in, in terms of analytical performance. So in summary, select is clearly better than, than PCA3. PCA3 has been compared to PHI, so you would say that there again, SELECT is the, the better one. SELECT and OPCO 4K, to my impression, have not been compared head-to-head -head yet. Okay, thank you. Is there anything I missed that uh, our audience should know? You think, Jack? Well, no, I, I, think, I think we are very excited that we will have this big prospective study where we can come with a clear argument whether the sequence, I mean, it's a great time. I mean, we have a number of tests, we have improved imaging, and now it's going to be the sequence. Is it going to be a simple test right. and then advanced imaging, 
or like many people at the moment do advanced imaging and then the new test. I, I, I think we are going to have that answer and and then hopefully, and I pro probably the USA will lead that field, we can again embark on some very constructive studies, see whether population-based screening makes sense. The one thing that we have shown convincingly is that you very significantly reduce the number of men identified with insignificant cancer. And I think we are at the, the first part of the introduction of this, and uh, I'm looking forward to that's, the first. Step. That's very important. The um, the other thing I think that where I like this is that I mean it, it, we're we're focusing on identifying significant cancers. We have been uh, sort of uh, in the realm of recommending PSA cutoffs of, of less than 1.5 and greater than 1.5. And uh, this fits perfectly. We just did uh, over 100 patients, uh, uh, actually 200 patients in our screening, and uh, not one person with a PSA of less than 1.5 had a positive select MDX test. And we'll be presenting that uh, at a couple of upcoming meetings. So it's, uh, it really fits in with the sort of the algorithm of finding significant cancers. So Jack, I wanna thank you a lot. Uh, I know it's late and and we appreciate you staying up to talk with us and uh, um, look forward to uh, seeing you in the very near future. Again, thanks. Okay, thank you. My pleasure, David.